Colorado Just got out of the service Now I'm looking for my fun Someday soon She'll go with me someday soon Her parents cannot stand me Cause I work the rodeo They say that he's a kind Leave you crying But I know she'll follow me Down any road I go Someday soon She'll go with me Someday soon Okay, we are in a unit where we're talking about facility construction. There are two video lectures that we've already done. Uh, this is the third and final video lecture. We ended the last video lecture talking about this, uh, this job I was on in Denver, managing a subcontractor who did an excellent job with the critical lift. Again, they were setting a 60,000 pound prefabricated bridge. Uh, the, Go ahead and move on. Uh, what I want to talk about in this last video lecture for this unit are specific construction hazards and some OSHA regulations and best practices that go along with those construction hazards. Uh, OSHA construction regulations are found in 29 CFR 1926. Uh, this is the Code of Federal Regulations number in for construction safety regulations. Um, I encourage all of you to take an OSHA 30 class. Uh, in that OSHA 30 class, you're going to learn more about construction hazards, uh, controls for those hazards, and specific construction regulations. But you know, it's it's a big topic. Even in 30 hours, you're not going to learn it all. Um, uh, 30 hours plus uh, 20 years, 10 years, then you're going to start getting a pretty good handle on uh, construction safety management. But the 30 hour class and a degree in EHS is a good starting point. Uh, I am going to talk more about the OSHA 30 hour class at the end of this, of this lecture. So let's go ahead and talk about some specific hazards and regulations. Uh, falls, if you're looking at all construction, about 36% of all fatalities in construction are fall related. And that's looking at all different types of construction, all the different trades. Roofers contribute um, a lot to these statistics. Uh, roofers of all the different trades, all the different specialty areas, roofers have more fall fatalities than any other group. Uh, so if you end up working for a roofing company or you end up managing a roofing operation, fall protection is going to be critical. Now the OSHA regulations for fall protection requires fall protection at a height of six feet or greater. If there's the potential that a worker could fall six feet or more, there has to be some type of protection in place. And we will have a unit in this class just on fall protection. So I'm not going to say a lot more about it now except for this. Uh, there are some companies that follow the general industry guidelines for fall protection. Uh, the general industry guidelines require fall protection 
at a height of four feet. And some construction companies have implemented this standard for construction operations. And I think that's a good practice. Uh, the worst the worst injuries that I've ever had to deal with when it comes to a, a fall incident were uh, incidents where the worker fell less than six feet. If we'd had a four foot fall, fall uh, limit in place implemented, if this had been implemented in our company, that incident would not have occurred. Uh, that put a worker in intensive care. So four feet, uh, I think, is the best practice. If possible, try to arrange the work so that you're not up in the air as much. Try to work on the ground as much as possible. And that uh, goes back to planning, uh, planning the work process, managing the work process. Uh, Guardrails are a common uh, method for providing fall protection. If we can't put fall protection or guardrails in place, then we can use a personal fall arrest system which involves a harness, a lanyard, and an anchorage point. And we will talk more about that in the fall unit. Another option, which I don't really care for this option, but OSHA does allow it, uh, would be the use of warning lines um, to create controlled access zones. The purpose of a warning line is to keep a worker away from the edge. Again, more in the fall unit. Nets are also an OSHA allowance you can use safety nets that would catch the worker when they fell you don't see these used that much anymore um, but it, it's still it's still used some and uh, and it is an acceptable method for fall protection another concern in construction that another type of incident that causes a lot of injuries and can result in fatalities would be dropped objects. Uh, dropped objects occur when we have elevated work and workers below have objects dropped on them. In elevated work where there is potential for dropped objects to injure personnel or damage property at a lower level. Some things we can do to control dropped objects. Uh, tow boards on our walkways. A tow board will help prevent materials, tools from being kicked uh, off of the work platform. You can use a, a curtain, a type of, of curtain that would keep uh, everything that could be dropped, it would keep those objects contained and prevent, prevent the object from falling to a lower level. Nets uh, erected below the, the, the work platform that would catch anything that was dropped. Uh, you can even get lanyards for your tools. A uh, lanyard is just a little piece of rope. I just think of it as a little piece of rope that is tied to you. Uh, one end is tied to you, the other end is tied to the tool. If you drop the tool, then the tool will not drop any further than the lanyard slash rope is long. You can also uh, cre uh, create controlled access, access zones. It's getting late. I'm starting to lose my voice. You can create controlled access zones to keep other people out of the area where dropped objects could fall. And that's what we see here. They're using some, some danger tape, some rope. They're using some, some security fencing, some safety fencing. And they're uh, keeping people out of this area using the safety fencing. You can't see it very well, but they've got, looks like a rope here and rope here. Then they've got the security fence here. The, the other end of the rope here is, is attached to the man lift. That is creating an area where there should not be any workers. In addition to putting up the rope or the danger tape, there should be uh, a sign similar to what we have here indicating that it's a dangerous area and this sign will talk about what uh, talk about the nature of the danger it says here overhead work overhead work going on there's a danger from the overhead work going on that's why no one should be in this area uh, now if we can prevent dropped objects 
that's the best solution. Preventing dropped objects can be done with curtains, nets, and tool lanyards. The controlled access zone would be next, next down on the list of effectiveness. Uh, with controlled access zones, there can still be dropped objects, but there's nobody going to be in there for those objects to hit. had uh, in my career probably three workers hit by dropped objects uh, the worst incident very fortunate that it wasn't a serious serious injury or even fatality uh, it was during a bridge demo job and a chunk of concrete came down and hit an employee right square in the crown of the hard hat uh, it knocked him down he ended up with uh, some uh, uh, injury to his neck, some strained muscles in his neck, but it could have been a lot worse. And if it had not had the hard hat on, it, it probably would have killed him. But even with the hard hat, um, there, there was a potential for much more serious injury. Remember, dr uh, a hard hat is not foolproof protection against overhead and flying objects. Uh, it's not, you know, there are people who are wearing hard hats who die when when they are hit in the hard hat with uh, with an object. It provides a level of protection but it's not perfect protection. It doesn't eliminate the danger. Another concern on construction sites would be anytime we, we are uh, uh, doing any kind of excavation work we need to provide cave-in protection if that excavation is five feet uh, in depth or deeper. But many companies go beyond this OSHA requirement. Again, this is OSHA. Many companies uh, use four foot as their standard. They start providing cave-in protection at a depth of four feet. And as far as cave-in protection, there are a lot of different methods. You can use trench boxes. You can uh, slope the excavation you can cut benches in the excavation. Uh, you can use shoring, depending on the excavation. There are several options available for cave-in protection. And those, that cave-in protection keeps the dirt from caving in on the worker. It happens every year, multiple fatalities every year when workers are in uh, an excavation that caves in on them. Another issue with any kind of excavation work would be what I call edge clearance. OSHA says there should be nothing within two feet of the edge of the excavation. Uh, I like to see three feet uh, as, as my edge clearance uh, standard, but most companies out there are going to go with, within two feet. The reason I like to see three feet provides a greater level of protection, a greater safety factor. But also, it's, uh, if everybody's shooting for three feet, if you train your workers that everything needs to be three feet from the edge, well, then you're going to have uh, a cushion there. If they, you know, maybe they're, they get a little confused and they put it at two and a half feet. That two and a half feet is still going to be uh, compliant with OSHA regulations. But again, it's not about the OSHA regulations. It's about uh, the safety of the workers. It's about preventing injury, preventing property loss. Now, these edge clearance requirements that I have here, this is for your common materials and tools and vehicles that you might have on a construction site. Uh, if it's heavy equipment like a crane, the rule of thumb is that the piece of equipment should be one foot away from the edge for every one foot of depth. So if it's a 10 foot deep excavation, that piece of heavy equipment, the crane or the bulldozer, needs to stay back at least 10 feet from the edge. Uh, there are instances though where you can have uh, engineers come in and perform an analysis, perform a safety plan. Uh, they, may, they may give the, the green light for setting up a crane closer to the edge than what this particular rule of thumb would allow. Excavations, you also have to have a safe way in and a safe way out. You have to provide safe egress. That could be a ladder, a stair, a ramp, a dirt ramp that's cut into the excavation. And uh, workers inside the excavation 
always have to be within 25 feet of a ladder, ramp, or stair within 25 feet of a safe means of egress. And this, this egress requirement that I'm talking about is required when the excavation is four feet deep or deeper. You also have to be cognizant of, aware of the potential for hazardous atmospheres. Some really deep excavations, there could be uh, uh, oxygen deficiencies that occur, there could be some toxic gases that are heavier than air that settle in the bottoms or settle into excavations. So a best practice is to uh, test your atmospheres periodically. Actually, I prefer testing continually. When you have workers in the excavation, at least one of those workers should be wearing a sniffer, uh, a gas tester, a gas monitor. They should be wearing that uh, at all times when they're inside the excavation, especially the deeper excavations that do not have uh, good natural ventilation. Also have to be aware of the potential for water accumulation uh, inside of an excavation. Water accumulation, water alone can be a danger to the workers, but water accumulating in your excavation can, can also contribute to cave-in. So uh, accumulating water is not a good thing. Uh, there are requirements for, uh, or there are allowances for dealing with the accumulation of water and the OSHA regulations were allowed to pump the water uh, maintain the water level at a safe level. It does have to be monitored by what we call a competent person. Uh, excavations need to be inspected by a competent person. Uh, a competent person is an OSHA term. A competent person is someone who has training and knowledge uh, necessary to recognize hazards, recognize hazardous conditions, they have the knowledge and training on how to correct hazardous conditions, and they also have the authority from the, uh, from the project owner, from the general contractor, from their company. They have the authority to take corrective action when it's necessary. Competent person doesn't have to ask if it's okay to make a correction. They have the authority to do it. But those are the three criteria for a uh, competent person. Another hazard on a lot of construction sites would be underground utilities and also overhead utilities. But here we're talking mostly about underground utilities. You need to have procedures in place for avoiding contact with utilities. Again, below grade and above ground. Below ground, above ground. Uh, one of the measures that needs to be taken is utilize a locate service. There are services that you can, you can uh, call. They will come out and uh, locate the approximate location of anything in the ground. A gas line, a telephone line, a water line, a sewer line, whatever it might be. But that locate service, the mark that they put on the ground or the flags that they put down, that is not, that is not the exact location. Uh, because that ex is, is, it, is not the exact location, we have to, to uh, perform what I call a soft excavation exploration. We have, to, we have to pothole, and pothole means hand digging until we find the exact location of the utility. Uh, now, when I say hand digging, it could use a vacuum excavation system that uses water and uh, vacuum pressure to suck the soil out of the pothole so we don't have to do it with the shovel. But we have to do something that's considered soft excavation that, will not, that does not have the potential to damage a utility to find that utility before we use any uh, machines for the excavation. Again, no mechanical excavation until visual verification of the depth, location, and direction of utility. And we gotta have visual ver verification. We gotta have eyes on it. We gotta know how deep it is. 
Uh, we got to know exactly where it's at and the direction that the utility is running. To know direction, you have to do multiple potholes. You can't just do one. You have to do multiple potholes. Um, I would say at least three to determine the direction that the utility is running uh, to, to verify where it's at and which direction it's going so we don't have any contact with the uh, utility when we bring out our, our heavy equipment for the excavation. Now what we have over here is called a dig permit and it's actually a, a planning tool. It's a set of instructions really for how to proceed uh, when you're doing excavation work, how to proceed without making contact with underground utilities. If all of the all of the requirements of the dig permit are properly followed, properly implemented, there should never be a utility contact. But you know it can still happen. But if you do it right, you dot your I's, cross your T's, you should not have any any contact with underground utilities. Uh, I do have a copy of this. If, if anybody would like to take a look at it, I'd be happy to share a copy with you. Not, a, not all companies do this, but it is, it's not an OSHA requirement either. It's what I would consider a best practice uh, to help avoid contact with underground utilities. A lot of the incidents that occur on construction sites are slips and trips. One way to help prevent slips and trips is providing good work access and good housekeeping on the job sites. Keep the active areas free of slip and trip hazards. If there's work going on in an area, there should not be any slip or trip hazards in that area. Um, now this is kind of crazy, uh, but when I was uh, with Kiwit, one of the area managers, I don't remember exactly what his title was, he, his standard was, for, for when it came to work access and housekeeping, his standard was that anybody who comes out here in a wheelchair should be able to get pretty much anywhere they need to go on our job sites without any major difficulties. We need to build our job sites and maintain our job sites so that someone is able to get around that job site in a wheelchair. Um, I have a, another personal standard that I use. I call it the grandma standard. Uh, your grandmother, 85 year old grandmother, should be able to come out to your job site and be able to safely move around that job site under her own power. As, again, assuming she's healthy and, and, and able to move around under her own, her own power. But the uh, grandma standard, wheelchair standard, that is setting the bar pretty high, but that's where we should set the bar to prevent incidents. Uh, make sure we are properly disposing of all waste materials. That's part of housekeeping. Proper storage of tools. Nothing irks me more than seeing a bunch of tools laying around that aren't being used. Once a tool, uh, once we're done with a tool, we need to put it away. We need to have a, a tool trailer or a, a Connex. We need to have a proper storage for the tools and the tools when they're not in use, when they're not needed, they need to go back into that, that storage area. And they need to be hung up properly. They need to be stored so they're, they're not going to be damaged. But that's getting beyond just work access and housekeeping. Uh, any unused construction materials, we need proper storage for those materials too. You'll see some construction sites, it just looks like a hurricane went through. You'll see uh, plywood laying here and two befores over there, and they're not in nice piles. They're not in nice stacks. They're just haphazardly just strewn all over the place. That, you know, that's not safe. Those, those things become trip hazards, uh, but it also reflects poorly on the company. Uh, you know, construction projects, most of them are out in the open where anybody can see what's going on. And when you have a messy job site, that, that reflects poorly on your company. Another way of, of creating good work access is through the use of ramps, stairs, and ladders. 
We talked about ramps, stairs, and ladders when we talked about excavation egress. But even if it's not an excavation, if you need to go from a lower level like we have here to an upper level, you know, build, build a stair. The stair is the best is the best option. A stair with a handrail. That's what we have. They've cut steps into the slope of the excavation, the slope of this of this grade. They've used plywood uh, to retain each of the steps. They backfilled it with, with gravel, uh, built a handrail. This is providing good, safe, efficient access and movement around the work site. Uh, equipment hazards, uh, I've mentioned before, we got heavy equipment that, that uh, can kill a worker in, in a split second if something uh, incorrect, something wrong, something goes wrong. Um, we have to pay attention to the heavy equipment on our job sites. When that equipment is delivered, there needs to be certain proce procedures that are followed for that safe delivery. There have been workers killed during the delivery process when a piece of heavy equipment falls off the trailer, falls off the float that it was hauled in on. We need to have maintenance and inspection procedures to, to make sure that the equipment is always in safe operating condition. Uh, controlled access zones around the heavy equipment. We need to try to keep people on foot away from areas where heavy equipment is operating. Uh, we need to have measures in place to control or manage traffic that might be passing through the construction site. This could be signs, this could be speed bumps, this could be barricades, a lot of different options for controlling traffic through the site. Uh, different, different projects would require different control measures. Also when it comes to equipment hazards, we need to make sure that we're putting qualified operators at the controls. We also need to make sure that the equipment that we're using on the project has a rated capacity has the rated capacity that it needs to do the job that we need done. Um, never will forget the time that usually I'm all over when it comes to capacity I'm, I'm talking about cranes but I'll never forget the incident still irks me to this day that a track hoe operator had a track hoe tipped up on the toes of the tracks. I mean it the back end of that track hoe was almost straight up in the air only just the toes of the tracks, the front part of the tracks, were on the ground. They were trying to lift a boulder that was way too big for that piece of equipment. Again, nobody was hurt. Uh, we we uh, got it under control. It did end up being an argument between me and the dude that was in charge of that project. But uh, that anytime you're tipping equipment, you're overloading the equipment. Anytime you're overloading it, the equipment, it's not fucking safe. Sorry, I got carried away there. Um, but still irks me to this day. Again, overloading equipment, tipping equipment, you're overloading it. It's not safe. You're, you're going beyond that equipment's capabilities. Somebody's going to get killed if you keep doing that stuff. So, yeah, I do apologize for my language, but uh, I do get, uh, I'm pretty passionate about this uh about this profession and don't want to see anyone killed and that kind of that kind of uh, uh, disregard for safety is what gets people killed okay, cranes and overhead lifting crane cranes this is my absolute favorite topic within construction when it comes to cranes and overhead lifting we got to make sure we have good ground conditions for that crane to operate on uh, the crane is only as strong as the ground that it's setting on. If the ground does not have adequate bearing capacity, then the crane can tip over. We also have to pay attention to the load capacity of the crane, which is related to the bearing capacity and related to the crane's structural capacity and the crane's tipping point. There are tipping limits, there are structural limits, and then we have the limit that is that is in place because of the strength of the soil or the surface we're sitting on. All of those have to 
have to be sufficient for whatever it is we're lifting. We have to pay attention to the to overhead power lines. Uh, so many crane incidents are related to overhead power lines. Uh, a part of the crane touches the overhead power lines. Um, and it all goes back to planning. Poor planning uh, results in contact with overhead power lines. And when overhead power lines are contacted, people can die. Uh, and one thing that's interesting about overhead power line incidents, it's usually not the crane operator that's killed. It's usually somebody on the ground because the electricity will go through the crane into the ground and then flow through the ground and can affect people standing in the area. And uh, yeah, I, I go into great detail talking about that phenomenon uh, in other classes. In controlled access zones again, uh, around wherever the crane's operating, you need to have that swing radius barricaded. Uh, most cranes will swing 360 degrees, they'll rotate 360 degrees. The, that 360 degree rotation creates a crush point that could crush someone if they get in that area. It is an OSHA requirement that that area be barricaded. It's not optional. It's got to be, it's got to be in place. I didn't work for the company at the time, but one of the companies I worked for just before I got there, they had recently dealt with a, a, a fatality, a fatality when a worker was crushed um, by a crane. If the swing radius barricade had been in place, if other control measures had been in place, the fatality would have been, um, could have been uh, avoided. Uh, Rigging is, uh, rigging is both a verb and a noun. Rigging are all the tools that we use to connect the load to the crane. Rigging is also the process, the action of connecting the load to the crane. Now, the rigging design has to be done correctly. If it's not done correctly, then you can have the biggest crane in the world, but if the rigging is not executed properly, then you could have an incident as well. Uh, one picture before we move on, this was on a job in Denver. This was a subcontractor. They were coming in to set some precast concrete uh, storm sewer components. They were large concrete, uh, uh, large concrete structures they were picking up and placing in an excavation that was right over in this area. It's, it's, it's out of the picture where they were placing it. But the problem here was that they were set up too close to the edge. And when I asked them to move further away from the edge, they said, well, we can't do that because we're not going to be able to lift up the 26,000 pounds that we need to lift up and set in the hole. Uh, a crane's capacity is a function of the distance between the crane and where the load is going to go. It's a function of the distance between the crane and where the load is going to be located at the beginning of the lift and at the end of the lift. So by moving him further back away from the edge, the crane did not have enough capacity. So what we ended up having to do is bring in another crane. The crane didn't have enough capacity. You can't set up on the edge like that. That crane set up on the edge like that, that, that could cause the excavation to cave in. Uh, that excavation caves in, the, the crane tips over. When it's loaded with 26,000 pounds, that's just uh, bad things can happen there. So you, know, you, you have to, when you're dealing with such dangerous equipment and dangerous loads, you got to do it right. And the only way to do it right was to get a bigger crane in and set up further away from the edge of the excavation. So I, these guys were not real happy with me this day, but they understood and they, they knew I was, I was right. And uh, it, the job got done and it didn't cause a major delay to the project. They had add some extra expense, but uh, uh, the expense that was added to the project was a lot less than the cost of, uh, of a fatality would have been or the cost, you know, let's say this crane 
uh, tipped over and hit one of these buildings uh, over here on the to the to the left in the photo. The damage to that building is going to cost a lot more than the cost incurred by bringing in a bigger crane. Ergonomic hazards, and like I said previously, we're talking about sprained back, sprained necks, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, tennis elbow, or I should say uh, lateral epicondylitis. That's the correct term for tennis elbow. And then we have we also have golfer's elbow, which is medial epicondylitis. That's the inside of the elbow. But these are the types of injuries we're talking about when we talk about ergonomic hazards. A lot of the injuries related to ergonomic hazards are related to lifting activities. Uh, workers trying to lift too much. Uh, to prevent workers trying to lift too much, companies can set lifting limits. OSHA doesn't have a lifting limit. Companies have to do that. Now there are suggestions, there are recommendations but uh, it's up to the company to follow those suggestions, those recommendations. Another option is to get help, you know, team lifting. If it's too heavy for one person, get two people involved. Too heavy for two, get three people involved. Also, to prevent injuries related to lifting, make sure workers understand proper lifting technique and make sure that they use proper lifting technique. And what we have down here in the lower right hand corner is a diagram uh, illustrating proper lifting technique. Uh, in addition to lifting, activities that involve repetitive motion can result in ergonomic uh, hazards or ergonomic type injuries, I should say. Uh, repetitive motion, doing the same thing over and over and over again throughout the entire work shift. You know, uh, swinging a hammer all day. That's how you end up with carpenter's elbow from swinging a hammer all day. That's an injury related to repetitive motion. Uh, to avoid repetitive motion injuries, we could set up some type of work rotation schedule. Uh, making sure workers have the right tools for the job also. Sometimes the, 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 the damage from the repetitive motion would not be as severe if the worker were using proper tools for the, for the work that they're doing. Now there are other ergonomic risk factors like awkward posture, compression, and vibration that would also need to be considered. Uh, I encourage all of you, if, uh, if, if you're going to make safety management your career, I encourage all of you to take ergonomics, take an ergonomics class, because it will talk about all the ergonomic risk factors and different methods that can be implemented to prevent work-related musculoskeletal disorders. Again, that's uh, the fancy term for what we're talking about when we talk about ergonomic hazards in the workplace. Work-related musculoskeletal disorders. And again, this is important. This is the most common and expensive type of injury affecting all industries. Every industry should have an ergonomics uh, program in place. Uh, but the odd thing about it, OSHA does not have any regulations. And I could spend 30 minutes talking about that. I won't bore you with it. But it's it just mind-boggling to me that the most common type of injury and the most expensive type of injury, there are no regulations from OSHA. Another concern for construction operations would be a variety of natural hazards. I've already mentioned lightning, but you know, lightning is a hazard. If you have workers outdoors, uh, you need to have a lightning policy. Uh, wind can also affect workers and affect uh, the construction project. That's what we have in the lower right-hand corner here. A building that was under construction was, was hit with a windstorm and we had a partial collapse and there were two workers that died in this partial collapse so we need to take those you know that particular hazard into consideration uh, when it comes to wind we also need to make sure that all of our materials the plywood and other materials on the job site are properly secured we don't want a storm coming along and blowing the plywood out onto the roadway an adjacent roadway uh, cranes can also be tipped over 
in, in heavy winds and high winds. So cranes need to be secured properly. Uh, th freeze thaw cycles. Uh, if it free the ground freezes at night, it thaws during the day, that can create mud, that can create instability in the soil for cranes and equipment. We have to monitor that as well. Uh, icy and wet conditions, slips and trips on ice or, uh, or wet surfaces. Uh, try to have good drainage for the construction site. You don't want your construction site become, becoming a swamp. Uh, mud control, and I'm, there's a specific thing here I'm referring to when I talk about mud control. Uh, if a construction site is muddy and it has trucks uh, entering and leaving the construction site throughout the workday, and concrete trucks delivering concrete, uh, other trucks making other deliveries, you have company vehicles coming in and out of the construction site, and they're getting mud on the vehicles or, or covered in mud when they leave, well, they track that mud out in the roadway. Once that mud is tracked out in the roadway, it could then cause a traffic accident, which could then turn into a lawsuit for the company. Uh, that has to be that has to be managed, and there are tools and procedures uh, for managing uh, uh, mud on a job site and methods and tools to prevent tracking mud out on the roadways. And it is a, it's also an OSHA issue as well, as far as tracking uh, mud, not OSHA, I'm sorry, EPA, environmental management issue, when it comes to mud control. Now, now please keep in mind, all of these different uh, points that I'm mentioning, you could do a whole class on just about any of them. I could talk 30 minutes just about a lightning policy. I could talk three hours about wind and wind loading. I could talk three hours just about cranes and wind. So I'm just trying to give you an overview of the kinds of things that you would have to be on the alert for if you were in the position uh, as an owner's representative on, a, on a, your owner's construction project. In addition to mud, we have to have me measures in place to control the dust. Water trucks, uh, that's, a, that's a common method to control dust, is keeping the surfaces sprayed down with water. Uh, to suppress the dust. Um, also an environmental issue, but also a, a health and safety issue. Uh, got all kinds of red already. Let me erase this. Another consideration that construction companies need to make, uh, people managing construction companies, are temporary structures and construction devices. Uh, when we talk about temporary structures and construction devices, we're talking about scaffolds, concrete forms, ladders, rebar assemblies, uh, shoring systems, uh, crane pads, yeah, anything that's, that's on the construction site, a lot of times that's constructed on the construction site uh, for a temporary period and that's used to help with the construction process that would fall into this category of TSCD, Temporary Structures and Construction Devices. These types of, uh, these structures need to be adequately designed. There needs to be a process in place, preferably involving an engineer, uh, to make sure that they're designed to be structurally sound and they're built to be structurally sound. Uh, at KeyWhip, we had a 200-page manual on how to, to manage temporary structures and construction devices. Um, at the end of this lecture, I want to show you a video of the worst construction accident in U.S. history. It was 51 men were killed because a temporary structure failed. So, uh, and I'll, I'll remind you of that before I start the video, that this, these men were killed by a temporary structure that failed. Uh, and you got to have these procedures in place, a procedure for designing, inspecting, and approving any kind of temporary structures on your job site. This is a risk matrix that's used at Kiwit. That's part of the process. And I'm not going to go into all the details here, but I, I'm just using uh, this to illustrate the, the degree we need to go to to make sure that everything's being done correctly on our project sites. Because if we don't do it correctly, people die. 
uh, in construction as we established in the first video. Uh, about a thousand people a year die on construction sites and a lot of times it's because somebody made a mistake. Somebody did something wrong uh, that resulted in the fatality. We also have concrete hazards. Go ahead and delete this red. Get a fresh start. Uh, there's hazards associated with the production of concrete, with transporting concrete, and the delivery of concrete on the, on the construction sites where we're going to pour the concrete. There needs to be hazard analyses in place for all of these different phases of a project that involves concrete. There are chemical hazards with concrete. And here's an example of an injury that is related to the chemicals in concrete. Uh, concrete has a high pH, it's, it's highly alkaline, it's a caustic, it will eat your skin away. And it will continue to eat your skin until it's neutralized. Um, measures need to be in place to protect workers from this type of injury from, from concrete. Uh, form work, false work, and rebar can fall over. Uh, speaking of uh, form work, false work, and rebar falling over, let me pull up this, uh, this uh, article. It says video, but it's actually an article with a picture. This was a few years ago, 2019, San Diego. Uh, one person was killed and four other people were hurt in a, a UC San Diego construction accident Thursday morning. Uh, UC San Diego, that's University of California, San Diego. They were building some dorms and some classrooms on campus when the rebar fell over. Let me zoom this up so you can see it a little better. Actually, here's a, here is a video. Let me go ahead and play this video. Yeah, we'll just play it in the small window here. One with a serious head in. Hello, Jen. Right behind me, you can take a look and see this is the site of that deadly accident. This is all meant to be one day of housing and classrooms for UC San Diego, but all of that construction took a deadly turn this morning when some of that rebar you can see behind me collapsed, injuring some of those workers, and now there is an investigation underway to look into how all this happened. About 8.30 Thursday morning, a nearly 35-foot rebar wall collapsed at this construction site near Torrey Pines Road in La Jolla. San Diego Fire Rescue tells Fox 5 four men were rushed to the hospital, one with a serious head injury who later died. Another man said to have serious injuries and two others also treated at the hospital but expected to be okay. The workers were on the site of a construction project for six new student housing buildings, classrooms, lecture halls, shops, dining options, and an underground parking lot. The California Division of Occupational Safety and Health is now looking into this accident. We reached out to the construction company involved and received this statement that reads in part, quote, We take all matters involving the safety of our workforce, our job sites, and the public seriously. Our deepest sympathies are with this individual's family, friends, and co-workers during this incredibly difficult time. And back out here live, still unclear how that rebar collapsed this morning. It's also unclear the condition of... Now go ahead and stop it here and I'll go ahead and zoom this picture up so you can see a little bit better what she was talking about in the video. Yeah, we got several rebar columns that are still standing that didn't fall over. These rebar columns, um, that's what we have, that's, that's what fell down. There's multiple rebar columns that fell fell down thousands and thousands of pounds, struck five workers, killing one of the workers. Um, this is the kind of falling object that your heart has not going to do you any good with. It's not going to it's not going to protect you from this type of falling object. Um, now this goes back, this type of accident, this goes back to what we were talking about with uh, temporary structures. That rebar uh, tower, that rebar column, that was a temporary structure. Uh, mistakes were made, I'm guessing, in 
uh, how they secured that structure. There should have been uh, there should have been false work in place to help that um, be stable in the vertical position. You know, there, there wasn't su sufficient false work in place or supports in place to keep it from falling over. Uh, once you get that high with your rebar at that weight, it's hard, it's hard for them to be freestanding without falling over. Uh, so those are the kinds of things. That's a, that's a very graphic example of a concrete hazard or concrete construction related hazard. Now the last that the video I talked about where the 51 workers died, that was also concrete related. Uh, it was it was formwork that collapsed. Uh, in another temporary structure. Another concrete hazard to be on, on alert for would be the silica in the concrete. Now silica in the concrete is only a problem after the concrete has cured, after it's solidified, and then you start cutting it or hitting on it with a hammer or something like that. They, it's okay until it dries and you create dust. When you create dust, then these microscopic sil silica particles become airborne and it can destroy a worker's lungs. It can lead to a number of different lung diseases and disorders. Uh, most of the time, it's going to, to be later in their life when they experience the symptoms from that exposure. Uh, and most of the time, it takes chronic exposure, multiple exposure over an extended period of time before there, there are uh, disorders, diseases that result. But it can be acute, meaning uh, a very high level of exposure over a short period of time can also have uh, uh, serious health consequences for workers. So silica is very important uh, to, to control, to manage. Uh, silica is the asbestos of the 21st century. You may have heard other people say that. I didn't come up with that. Uh, I don't know who I got it from, but uh, silica is going to be like the asbestos of the 21st century. Uh, and if you're in my industrial hygiene class, you've already heard me talk about silica, so I won't say a lot about it. If you do have a lot more about it, if you do have questions, though, let me know. Uh, construction sites may also have what we call confined spaces. A confined space is any space with restricted entry or exit. It's big enough though for a human to enter, but it's not intended for human occupancy. And there are potential hazards in the space. One of those hazards could be a dangerous atmosphere or other hazards. In the photos here, we have a couple of classic examples of confined spaces in construction. We have a, a culvert that a worker's in, confined space. It's hard to get in and out of. It's big enough for someone to get in. It's not intended for human occupancy. And there are a variety of potential hazards that could exist in this space. Same thing with, I don't know if this is a sanitary or a storm sewer, uh, but we have a worker entering a manhole. That, uh, that is a confined space that he's entering. Other examples, uh, tanks, deep excavations, even some large equipment might be big enough for uh, a worker to crawl inside to do a repair. That Those types of spaces, those would have to be considered confined spaces as well. Uh, safe operating procedures need to be in place. There's an entire section of the OSHA regulations devoted to confined spaces in construction which we cover in, in the construction safety management class. I'm uh, just, you know, again, touching on the, the basics here, the very, very basics. But we need safe operating procedures. Uh, we need to determine if it's what we call a per permit required confined space or if it's a non-permit confined, confined space. The permit required confined spaces require more uh, strict procedures to be followed. Uh, these are some of the procedures that would need to be followed in a permit required confined space. But again, I encourage you to take the construction management, construction safety management class where we will go in detail uh, talking about uh, confined spaces and procedures uh, that need to be followed when working at a confined space. Uh, 
Electrical tools can be a hazard or any kind of temporary electrical devices like extension cords, power tools. Uh, you need to have GFCI protection for any, uh, any tool that's uh, used in electrical tool that's used in construction. Uh, generators, we need to have procedures and, uh, for safely using generators. We need to be aware of the hazards associated with generators also. Um, now, power tools, we're talking about non-electrical power tools like the quickie saw that we have here, also referred to as a demolition saw. Uh, very dangerous tools. Uh, workers have been killed by demo saws, by quickie saws. Uh, most of these engines are going to be 75, 80, 90 cc's, very big engines, and they've got very big blades. Uh, they're, and they're, they're two cycle engines, so they're going to be more powerful than a comparable four cycle engine. A lot of horsepower, a lot of power. Uh, I've known uh, two workers uh, who have been seriously injured by these saws. Um, the one worker was lucky to be alive. The saw kicked back and hit him in the face. Um, there, I, I know of other cases where workers have been killed when the saw kicks back. One case in particular, the saw kicked back, hit him in the throat, and they, they bled out almost instantaneously from the severity of the wound and the, the artery that was severed uh, by the blade. So very dangerous saws but these aren't the only saws that are dangerous any of the power to pretty much any of the power tools used in construction you got to have proper training for the operator you got to uh, recognize the hazards and not get complacent with those tools uh, there are chainsaws for cutting concrete there are other types of concrete saws just a simple little circular saw uh, your grandpa probably called it a skill saw there there can be fatal injuries from those uh, types of saws as well so anything with a rotating blade you got to have training and there it, it, it can't hurt hurt people severely anything with a rotating blade guards have to be in place any tool that came with a guard from the factory the guard has to be used at all times you can't take the guard off uh, when the tool is in use another issue with power tools gasoline powered gasoline powered uh, power tools is the refueling procedure. If you refuel one of these tools while they're hot, there's a chance that a fire could occur. You need to follow uh, the manufacturer's recommendations for uh, refueling the, these tools. The manufacturer's recommendations are going to recommend that you allow the engine to cool down for a few minutes before you attempt to refuel that engine. Uh, and this is pretty much true for any construction tool that's powered by an internal combustion gasoline or diesel powered engine. Uh, you need to let it cool down for a little bit before refueling. Uh, some power tools require specific types of PPE. If you're using a chainsaw, most companies require whoever's using that chainsaw to wear what we call chainsaw shaps, leggings, protective leggings to protect the worker from the chainsaw if it kicks back. Uh, some companies also require protective leggings when workers use the demo saws. Even though they don't really, the protective leggings don't really work well with the demo saws, uh, some companies still require it. So make sure you have the right PPE uh, to protect the workers who are using the saws. That would include uh, a full face shield, safety glasses, hard hat, uh, may, maybe, maybe not gloves depending on what you're doing. Uh, overhead power lines, also a concern that I've mentioned a couple of times now. Like I said before, when there's contact with overhead power lines, it's usually the people who on the ground who are injured or killed. Uh, operators can also be injured or killed, but it's usually the people on the ground who are affected by the electricity coming through the ground. Uh, we need to have procedures in place to prevent contact. 
some of these procedures include relocation of the power lines, get them out of the way so we can do our work. If we can't relocate them, we de-energize them. We reroute the electricity so there's no electricity going through the power lines. If that's not possible, we know the voltage of the power lines and then we maintain a safe distance away from those power lines. The higher the voltage, the more distance we need from the power lines. Other options uh, for preventing contact, use of spotters or different visibility devices. Different things, uh, there are devices that we can put on the power lines that make the power lines more visible. Uh, emergency procedures, we need to have a plan uh, for what to do if we have power line contact. And part of that emergency procedure would be making sure workers know what to do if they're on the ground when uh, electricity may be going through the ground. Uh, when electricity is going through the ground, that sets up a phenomenon that we call step potential. And to keep it short, because I'm running long on time here, uh, when we have electricity going through the ground, workers should not take a normal length step. They should keep their feet together and slowly shuffle out of the area. If you would like a more detailed explanation of why they should keep their feet together and shuffle out of the area, you know, you, I'll talk about it in some of my other classes. We can talk about it in the office. Uh, more than happy to talk about it, but again, we are running kind of long on this video. Just Again, this touching on some of the hazards and things we need to be aware of if we are managing safe safety on a construction site. And that brings us to the video that I want to show you. Um, this has to do with temporary structures and construction devices. This also has to do with uh, concrete construction. Uh, this is the worst construction accident in U.S. history. Not in the history of North America, but in U.S. history. It happened in West Virginia in 1978. 51 workers were killed within about 60 seconds. And I'll just show the video and, and let you see what happened. Just off Highway 2 in Willow Island, West Virginia, a stone's throw from the muddy Ohio River, stands a simple monument. Upon closer inspection, it is a somber memorial. The memorial is made out of concrete going up into the shape of a cooling tower. And it has a bronze plaque on the front of it with the 51 names, and then it has a verse on the front. Anthony Lauer, beginning at age 12, spearheaded the fundraising efforts to build the memorial. Nine of his relatives, including his grandfather, are among the names on the plaque. What I learned in doing the project was pretty much everything because when I first started, no one ever talked about it around the house. Then I turned to the books, which the textbooks really didn't have much either. And then while doing the project, I learned what happened. What happened on April 27, 1978, was the worst construction accident in U.S. history. And it happened less than a half mile from here. This is the Pleasance Power Station in Willow Island, West Virginia. The power plant burns coal, heating water pumped from the Ohio River to create steam, which turns the electricity generating turbines. Before returning to the plant, the water must be cooled in these tall concrete structures known as natural draft cooling towers. The identical towers are notable for their considerable size. 428 feet high, 359 feet wide at the base, and distinctive shape. We call it the hyperbolic paraboloid shape, uh, which, by the way, helps it uh, generate natural draft. Uh, it is uh, an extremely difficult structure to construct. One cannot construct this uh, tower using normal methods. In 1977, the contractor, Research Cottrell, decided to use its newly patented and highly complex lift system called a jump form. It combined both scaffolding. Yeah, the jump form is a temporary structure. It is a construction device. Um, it was an ingenious design. 
it wasn't thoroughly engineered and tested the, the, the jump form along with the procedure and that's what resulted in the accident. And the formwork into which concrete was poured. It is a traveling scaffold that's literally climbing up uh, the constructed portion of the tower. Unlike traditional scaffolding, the jump form system was not anchored to the ground, only to the previously poured forms of the concrete shell. The most critical components of the system are these vertical jump form beams. Those beams were bolted on both the outside face as well as the inside face of the concrete shell so that the whole assembly of scaffold on the outside and the inside would ride, so to speak, on those beams. To move the system up, workers unbolted the lowest beams, leapfrogged them to the top, and reattached them to the concrete shell. Then the entire system was jacked up by a hydraulic ram. As construction progressed, the cooling tower shell bore the weight of the scaffold, work platforms, and several dozen workers. You had uh, carpenters there moving this, this, the forming system up. You had arm workers there tying reinforcement bars. You had laborers there that were uh, coming in behind actually pouring the concrete. Six cathead cranes hoisting 3,000 pound buckets of concrete were also supported by the tower shell. Using this complex but effective method, the construction crew had successfully completed the first tower by August of 1977. Work on the second tower began in the spring of 1978, as soon as the weather was warm enough. The crew poured concrete in five-foot high sections called lifts. The goal was to pour one lift every day. On April 27, 1978, they had constructed 28 lifts and uh, they were about to construct, or they had started actually, to construct uh, lift number 29. At 10 a.m., 51 workers were on the scaffold, which encircled the top of the tower 166 feet above the ground. As the day's third bucket of concrete neared the top, workers on the ground heard a loud, violent noise. It was somewhere like uh, lightning striking right next to, you know, that, that heard this crack. The entire scaffold and construction system began to collapse as the top layer of concrete crumbled. Starting at the north end of the tower, the concrete and scaffold peeled off in both directions, detaching from the rim and falling inward. I estimate that it was probably less than a minute, uh, much less than a minute. It, uh, once it started going, uh, its speed must have uh, started uh, actually increasing because of the added weight that was pulling down the rest of the scaffold. It brought down all 51 men with it. Workers on the ground ran through the shroud of dust and into the tower. Our first thought was to look for uh, our fellow workers who uh, were on that tower. Everyone was scrambling looking for uh, someone, you know, to see if there was anyone alive. And of course, in the end, there wasn't anyone. Engineers from the National Bureau of Standards and from private firms arrived to sift through the wreckage and determine what had caused the deadliest construction accident on American soil. During lab tests on the disintegrated concrete from the 28th lift, the NBS made an important discovery. We estimated that strength to be somewhere around 200 PSI. Normally, that for that construction, they should have had about 800 PSI concrete. Concrete gains strength due, uh, for two, re two factors. One is the temperature condition, the other one is uh, time. The temperature that night dipped down substantially low, so that the strength gain was much, much slower than the previous days. There's little doubt that the partially cured concrete had not been strong enough to hold up the scaffold. But other analysts trace the main cause to a critical failure lower on the tower. When we examined the beams themselves that were at the base of the tower, we found that the actual point where they had been connected, or they were supposed to have been connected, were intact and they were not deformed. In other words, some of the lower bolts had not been connected to the concrete at all. 
the evidence suggested that the construction crew had prematurely unbolted the jump form beams from lift 27, where the cured concrete would have been of sufficient strength. The forensic engineers did agree on two very important points. One was the vital importance of properly engineered scaffolding. The failed scaffold at Pleasant's power station brought this often overlooked problem to the foreground. In fact, our investigation showed that it was not even an engineered structure. It was put together by some very sharp inventor that had some good practical knowledge, but nothing of systematic engineering uh, to engineer a critical component like that. The other point was the need for on-site testing of concrete strength. So now the non-destructive testing procedure in some parts of the United States must be used to determine the strength of concrete prior to removing forms. As a result, I don't think that we haven't seen as many of construction failures in this country. As for the Pleasant's cooling tower, the job was completed 18 months later using traditional scaffolding. But it took many more years for the emotional scars to heal. Since I got this done, I found that people are more open to talk about it now. Like, normally no one would talk about it, but now that it's complete, and it lets people know that it's okay. We can talk about it now. In the end, the Pleasant's cooling tower collapse resulted from the failure of two elements found at nearly every major construction site. Concrete and scaffolding. The disaster was tragic proof that such elements, no matter how common, can never be taken for granted. Just off highway... And that's correct, concrete and scaffolding, but there were, there's more to it than just that. It was uh, uh, a temporary structure that wasn't adequately designed, and, and to use the, the guy's uh, term from the, uh, from the video, it wasn't systematically engineered. It wasn't tested properly. And systematic engineering would involve a testing procedure to make sure that it's safe. Uh, another another issue going on there, uh, in summary, was the the natural hazards, the the temperatures, the temperatures the night before uh, prevented the concrete from reaching an adequate compressive strength for the procedure that they were going that they tried to perform the next day. Um, you also had human error. According to the video, it, it appears that uh, uh, someone failed to properly bolt the structure into place. Again, a properly engineered system would not have failed because one, because one or two bolts were left out. Uh, a lot of different variables played into this. Uh, it's a, I've got at, as a title of this slide, Why So Serious? Uh, uh, I've been asked that question before. Why am I so serious about safety? Because if we're not serious about it, uh, people die. In this case, 51 people died. Uh, and that's what we want to prevent. We want everybody to go home safely. We want, we want everybody to go home in one piece. Um, that's what safety management is really all about. So that's why it is so serious to prevent uh, this type of incident or to, you know, prevent, to prevent an injury. That's why it's serious. Um, well, that brings us to uh, to our conclusion for this video. This is the last video uh, for this unit. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. I do have one other thing I want to mention. Whoops. Actually, hold on just a second if you'll bear with me. Yeah, I mentioned several times throughout uh, the videos that we have a construction class or a construction safety class. Uh, the OSHA 30 for construction, it's an OSHA sponsored uh, uh, class and curriculum. It's done, uh, I'm an OSHA authorized instructor, I'm the person who teaches the class. Uh, at the conclusion of the class, you don't receive course credit, but you do receive a certification that is more valuable than course credit. There are some employers out there, many employers actually, who require all of their safety personnel to have this certificate. 
uh, and they will not consider any applicants who do not have the OSHA 30 certificate. Uh, the class this year, uh, this coming year, will be May 2023. I'll probably do one in Tahlequah and one in Broken Arrow. Uh, I do this every other year. I don't do it every year. used to do it every year, but now I just do it every, every other year. Uh, Tahlequah uh, will be one week. Broken Arrow will be one week. It is a week-long class. We meet eight to four uh, for five days. And during that, uh, uh, during that five day period, we have 30 hours of contact, actual training time. And that's why it's called the OSHA 30. If you have any interest in the class, let me know. I'll, I will be sending out emails uh, and uh, it's really early right now, but this is the first notification about the class in May. Uh, you guys have a good day. I'm tired. I'm losing my voice. It's late. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you in the next video.